as it's a couple minutes past past noon, we will get started. So hello and welcome everybody. Uh, we would like to welcome you to the second of four webinars during the 37th annual Kempfel Winter Woodlock Conference. My name is Olivia Foster and I'm the Communications Coordinator at the Ontario Woodlot Association and I will be moderating today's session. The Planning Committee has put together a great lineup of speakers and I will turn it over to Executive Director of the Ontario Woodlot Association and Eastern Ontario Model Forest, John Pino, to say a couple of words on behalf of the organizations. Thank you, Olivia. I just want to offer a sincere thanks to our sponsors and, and the support you provide allows us to keep this uh, this wonderful long-term tradition going. And, and thanks to all of the speakers and presenters who volunteered to uh, to to be a part of this and and uh, to give us their time and effort. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the Eastern Ontario Model Forest and the Ontario Woodlot Association are now co conjoined, <laughs> for for lack of a better term. But we've come together formally and soon legally. We'll we'll remain two separate entities and organizations. But the idea is that the OWA, the Ontario Woodlot Association, be the nonprofit arm and, and do those sorts of things. And East Ontario Model Forest will be more the charity arm and, and continue to do all the wonderful things it's done in the past and its legacy will be strong and, and well-managed and, and delivered upon. So it's, uh, it's a, a logical thing to share administrative and managerial oversight and to, uh, to also have uh, so many volunteers who, who belong to both organizations uh, at the same time helping out and, uh, particularly want to thank uh, Martin and Dorothy from Storm on Dundas and Glendagary chapter and, and longtime model forest volunteers as well for overseeing a lot of this work and others, and of course, in the chapter there too, but uh, just, just a great, uh, great, one of the many legacies that we're keeping alive and well for the long term with the uh, Eastern Ontario model forest. So that's, that's all I've really got to say. We got a great uh, presentation again today. Last week was excellent with our crew as well. And more to come in the coming uh, couple of Wednesdays. It is Wednesday today, uh, I think, and hope. Yeah, good. So uh, I'll, I'll send it back to you, Olivia. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks for that uh, introduction, John. Um, just before we dive in today, I'll just go over a couple of the housekeeping items. So as you'll see, all participants' cameras and microphones are muted except for the panelists. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we encourage you to type your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, if you would prefer to ask your question out loud, you're welcome to click the button that raises your hands and we can unmute you. Um, we'll only do this during the, the Q&A session. Um, lastly, the uh, presentation will be recorded and uploaded to the Ontario Woodlot Association YouTube account. Now, uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to Dorothy Hamilton, representing the Planning Committee, to say a few words on behalf of the committee and to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Olivia. Um, first of all, uh, the Planning Committee, uh, we, we forgot a couple of names. Jim Hendry was also part of the Planning Committee, uh, part of my sd &G chapter, and Olivia was our savior for our fourth speaker. She managed to find an excellent speaker on the fourth day of, about rare, threatened, and endangered species and a program that uh, is being carried out um, uh, there. And I, I, it looks, I've seen the YouTube video and it really looks exciting. So I, I ask everybody to tune in for that one, but also tune in for number three. So, and I, and uh, thank John for the introduction. Um, so this, this particular presentation was my thought because in my area, uh, uh, windrows and shelter woods, uh, not that we, we do have some shelter woods, but mainly windrows are coming down or, or uh, windrows are coming down. And uh, not necessarily just because agriculture is increasing and people are increasing the area of their, of their field side, but most of our windrows are all affected by uh, emerald ash borer and, and a couple of other diseases out there. And, and so the windrows aren't really that, that They've never been well maintained and, and they're dying out. So it, it, uh, it's not really a surprise. But luckily, we have the ALICE program in, in SDNG, and uh, it's actually starting to uh, put some thoughts back into putting uh, more windrows and shelter belts in. And I'm hoping that 
Dave uh, can not only influence my chapter, but chapters uh, uh, around Southern Ontario. So Dave, I, I did a little, um, uh, found out you belong to the here in Perth chapter. Uh, you joined supposedly in 2011. And I had the, uh, uh, was one of the people that uh, toured your uh, uh, woodlot in 2018 when we went down to Shakespeare, Ontario. And uh, basically you showed us two wood lots uh, that had been uh, grazed by cattle and you were trying to bring them back. And uh, you had done some planting and you had hired a forester to do some management on your wood lots. So we were, we were quite well entertained while we were out at your property. So that's sort of where I, I also got your name. So that was, <laughs> that was sort of how you came to get on my radar. So, um, just a small introduction that Dave provided. Uh, he resides uh, and farms in Perth County with his wife, Connie, and has recently retired from a career in private land stewardship and resource management with the province of Ontario and several conservation authorities. For over 35 years, Dave has worked with the MNRF, MOE, and OMAFRA doing uh, resource issues. In his spare time, Dave works away in his woodlots, serves as a board of director with the church, the Here in Perth chapter, and the Here in Perth Agricultural Science Center. So he's like me, he's retired, but he's still working. So uh, that's that's good. So uh, without further ado, I'll let Dave uh, begin with his talk, uh, The Unsung Heroes of Agroforestry Systems, Windbreaks. Thank you, uh, Dorothy and uh, the planning committee for the opportunity to speak. I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay? And the presentation's yep. up. Very good. So, um, yeah, as Dorothy said, um, I spent some time with uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Food in the in the the end of my career, and trying to advocate for force. And as Dorothy mentioned, there's windbreaks, there's fence rows coming out uh, in eastern Ontario, but here in the southwest as well. And so, one of the things I thought we would um, look at today is Windbreaks are shelter births. They're planted for a purpose. Uh, how would we define them? Why are those fence rows and windbreaks being removed? And it might be animal dashboard, but um, as Dorothy alluded to, there's other factors. So what are they? And then what happens when we take those uh, features out of the landscape? I call windbreaks and shelter belts, fence rows, the unsung heroes of agroforestry because they can do so much. And we won't have time in the uh, 45 minutes or so today to look at all the functions of a windbreak. Needless to say, they are multifunctional. We'll look at a few of the, uh, the more important ones in my mind. If we uh, have windbreaks on our farms, uh, we're planning to put them in. There's some planning and maintenance that we need to expect. And then Dorothy said, uh, one of the questions when she contacted me is, you know, where are the funding sources? So we will take a, a very brief look at who might help pay so when we think of windbreaks or shelter belts, um, this is a definition, if you remember, Todd Ludy was agroforestry specialist in Amafra many years ago. And, and really windbreaks are uh, a wind barrier, uh, a vegetation that can be trees or shrubs that slows the wind down and mitigates any negative impacts. And typically a windbreak is associated with one or more row of trees or shrubs, either in an open field or adjacent to buildings. Now shelter belts, really the only difference between that and a windbreak is a number of rows and suggestion that a shelter belt has at least six rows, uh, but the function is the same as that of a windbreak. And so in my mind, trees, windbreaks, shelter belts, they're trees planted for a purpose. And this is a picture of uh, one of the farms here in Perth County that has a three row windbreak, uh, Eastern white cedar, white pine, and Norway spruce. And the left image is the aerial shot of that farm. And you can see windbreaks on both the uh, upwind and leeward side of those three rows, protecting um, the farm where they're planted, but also offering some protection to the farm downwind. And uh, those have been in for 25 to 30 years. That's a mature windbreak. Somebody had the foresight to do the planting. The image on the left, uh, a little bit more recent windbreak, two rows of Norway spruce. And then the image on the right, somebody more recently in the last 10, 15 years has decided that they also need 
a windbreak and they've planted a single row of Norway spruce. So there is still some uh, windbreaks on the landscape, some fence rows on the wind on the landscape, but the number is decreasing. And so we ask ourselves, why are landowners removing fence rows and windbreaks? In 2014, Stats Canada suggests that there were 28% um, of the farms in Ontario still had windbreaks. And I would suggest that in the 10 years since that, that number is probably much less than 28%. Part of that reason, at least in our area, is land values. So farmers in here on Perth are paying anywhere from $25,000 to $35,000 an acre for their croplands. And so in their mind, they need every square inch to grow a crop. And as Dorothy alluded to, as farms become larger, uh, it's simpler and more efficient in their mind to take the windbreaks, take the fence rows out because they have larger equipment and uh, they're not you know, running into the branches, the overhanging limbs. This despite that science proves that yields are higher with property design windbreaks. Um, even though we can prove that, trees are still being cleared uh, for more land for cultivation. And so some of the things we consider, and there's been a lot of research out there on attitudes towards conservation practices. And so is there a difference between owned and rented land? Are there some other factors out there that would suggest uh, are influencing people? And then lastly, who is it that farmers trust for their advice? And is that an influence on why windbreaks and fence rows are coming out? So this first table actually comes from the Ontario Woodlander. And uh, it was an article written by, by Dr. Uh, Michael Drescher from University of Waterloo. And in his research, when he surveyed farmers, he found that if the farmer maintained their own land, then the yellow representing windbreaks, the blue representing riparian buffers, the green representing form far, forests, that they were actively maintaining their force, about 72% of those who were surveyed, 64% of those who surveyed were actively maintaining windbreaks and about half the riparian buffers. Now I noticed the middle columns where uh, the survey spoke about rented land and that number dropped significantly to the point where anywhere from 12 to 20% of those windbreaks and forests are being managed on rented land. So certainly we can see some influence there on land ownership and conservation practices. The last uh, set of columns uh, were observations made by those who were surveyed that said on adjacent land removed by neighbors, about 50% of them are seeing woodlots, fence rows, riparian buffers removed by their neighbors. And I can attest to our farm, even um, we uh, woke up one morning to find out that the fence road to the west of our property uh, was no longer there because the neighbor to the uh, west decided that he could gain an extra foot or two by taking those trees out. Jeff Brick uh, was with the Upper, uh, Upper Thames River Conservation Authority and back in 2013 did a study, again by survey uh, of farmers and landowners, again assessing their attitudes towards conservation practices. And, and among other um, factors, Jeff looked at age, he looked at the size of the farm, he looked at education, and he looked at conservation ethic. There's been a lot of studies done around these attitudes and what may influence them. And, and unfortunately, if we look at the studies, we can find that the results are very conflicting. So some studies would suggest that age uh, is a factor in that older farmers are retaining the windbreaks, younger ones are taking the windbreaks and fence rows out. And so we might ask ourselves, why is this? And it could be just that the older farmers were the ones who established those windbreaks, left the fence rows in because they saw the benefit. Perhaps they were even educated on the benefit of that. But the younger ones don't fully understand that. They see on their yield monitor that the yield adjacent to that windbreak is significantly less than what their average yield is, but they don't realize that there's benefits further out. And we'll take a look at those as we go. Size of farm studies would suggest that the bigger the farm, the more likely they are to maintain those natural features. And again, though, I would suggest we're seeing a little bit of a turnaround in that, in that as farms get bigger and equipment gets bigger, some of those fence rows and windbreaks are coming out. Jeff's study also looked at education as have other studies. 
and suggesting that uh, the generation uh, of myself or a little bit higher uh, were well educated in agriculture, typically had university degrees. And Jeff's study suggests that the generation following is a little bit less educated in terms of formal education. So they're not going to university, but instead they're doing a, a two year college diploma. So does education uh, have a role in what's going on in the landscape? And then Jeff also looked at conservation ethic. And if you think about it, we all have values. We all have our own ethics when it comes to trees and woodlots. And I'd suggest on this group, probably everybody has a very high conservation ethic when it comes to trees and windbreaks and fence rows. But our ethic, our values may be in conflict or be different than those who have uh, an ethic and a value where they want to maximize their yields on the crop land that they have. And so that's where we start to see some conflict uh, between those ethics. Not to say that conflict is always bad, but it's a difference of what we value as individuals. This last graph is a study done by Linda Procopi and Linda's with Purdue University. And she looked at who do farmers trust. And, and so she did a survey as well. And she asked farmers to indicate which groups or individuals influence you the most when you make decisions about agricultural practices and strategies. And uh, on the left, we start with family is probably the biggest influencer on decisions on the farm. And then we run into chemical dealers and seed dealers, consultants. In Ontario, we might call those agronomists, uh, the landlord, other farmers. It's not until we get down to about the middle of that chart that we find that there's any trust or influence from government. And this is a U.S. survey, so you see that NRCS shows up. But NRCS is barely more of an influencer than the farmer's banker or lawyer. Uh, we start getting down into university extension, uh, farm organizations, finally we get into state government. Last, on the right-hand side, the least influential in this survey turned out to be conservation staff. And so what does that tell us about um, who we need to reach or how can we influence farmers' attitudes? And the Ministry of Agriculture and Food uh, did a bit of a shift a number of years ago in how they reached out and who they reached out to. And if you've heard of the 4R Nutrient Stewardry Program, trying to get farmers to um, modify practices around nutrient use, they didn't go straight to the farmers, but they went to who the farmers would go to for information. And again, that would be your fertilizer sales and dealers. That would be your agronomists. And so the program was delivered through those people uh, with the sense that those are the people that farmers are going to trust more so than if you or I or if an extension person went out on the ground and tried to convince them. They also launched a uh, program called the Farmland Health Checkup through the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. So they paid for a couple hours of an agronomist time to go out and meet with farmers who identified some uh, conservation issues on their property, typically around soil and soil health. But those agronomists are trusted. They're already used by the farmers in growing their crops. So what better people to share the message of soil conservation? So perhaps we as conservationists uh, with a passion for woodlots and windbreaks, maybe we need to think a little bit more about who should carry that message. Who are the farmers landowners going to trust if they're not going to trust conservation staff and uh, government staff? So something to think about. And then, of course, why are landowners removing fence rows and windbreaks? Uh, because there's work and there's issues. So whether it's dead ash and dead elm that need to be removed, if there's a windbreak that needs to be maintained, either through thrinning or pruning, uh, if there's a row or two of eastern white cedar, then there's likely a good chance that the tiles are plugged. And so the farmers, the landowners see it as a workload issue and uh, may decide that it's not worth the hassle and they're gonna get rid of those windrows before they become a hassle. So we need to ask ourselves the so what? So what if they're taking out the windrows? What if they're taking out the fence rows? And the quote on the screen now is from Keith Walston. Keith was a uh, publisher of a magazine called The Rural Voice in our area. It reached, uh, still reaches about 11,000 farmers. And in a study that Jeff Brickett did, he interviewed Keith 
And this is what Keith quoted. And he says, ironically, at a time when land is seen as too valuable to waste in windbreaks, buffer strips, and fence rows, the very topsoil that makes the land valuable for crops can be endangered by the lack of those soil conserving practices. And so Keith is right on. By removing those natural features like fence rows and windbreaks, we can cause more harm to the soil, more expense to the farm than if we had left those features in place. And so a couple of examples we'll look at uh, in the next few slides is things like gully erosion and water erosion. A lot of farms experiencing erosion as those fields get bigger. And then what do they need to do? They need to spend money and put in um, berms or grass waterways. So they're really not doing themselves any favor as they take out those fence rows. So when we take out those fence rows and windbreaks, we open ourselves and our soils up to an increase in soil erosion. And on the left is just a graphic that shows how soil particles move. And so as the wind hits exposed soil, the larger particles like sand simply creep and shift across the soil surface. Bigger particles get lifted up and they move a little bit. The finer particles like clay tend to be airborne and become suspended. And so the picture on the right, maybe all seen this in the, in the past, is soil particles suspended and, and we would call that a sand storm. The picture on the left was taken by a former colleague of mine, Andrew Barry, in 2012. Uh, and if you remember that really dry spring we had, maybe similar to what we're going to experience this year, the unprotected soil was dry and the wind picked up a lot of dirt and it moved it. But that soil erosion by wind can happen in the winter as well. The photo on the right is one taken in the Stratford area. And you can see a roadside ditch where the snow is covered in soil. And so we're losing soil uh, topsoil off those farms and it's being deposited where it's no good. In extreme cases where farmers are losing a, a lot of soil on slopes, they're spending a lot of money to dig that back up and move it to where it came from. And again, with a little bit of planning, not just windbreaks, leaving fence rows in, cover crops, whatever, that soil is going to stay where it needs to be. And the other issue we find is the soil blows as it drifts. It's not just the topsoil that uh, can be an issue but it's carrying nutrients like phosphorus with it as well that can get into the water courses. Along with wind erosion, we see uh, soil erosion from water. And these two pictures are examples of what we would call gully erosion. And if you notice the field characteristics, they're not overly steep, but they're quite long, quite broad. And the principle is that when water falls on a field in a catchment area, the more longer distance that water has to travel, the greater the slope, the more power that water is going to pick up. It's called stream power index. And so the more power it has, because it's traveling further, uh, because it's a steeper slope, the more soil that is going to take out. Those fence rows, those wind breaks can actually act as a water break. It's going to slow that water down. I'm going to use this as an example. So this is in uh, Wellington County, not too far from where I am. The picture on the left shows uh, a couple small fields that up until about two years ago had fence rows um, at the top of the slope midfield. The one on the right is a picture taken from this winter. A new farmer decided he would make one big field out of all those three fields in the left image. And so he removed the fence rows. You can see in the bottom, looking at that field, there is quite a significant slope to it. So there's already a risk from water erosion uh, based on that slope, that soil is going to be moved down slope. And as I said, some farmers will actually pay to dig that back up and move it to the top. Then it's another cycle. A couple big rains, another 10 years, the soil's back down on the bottom. They pay to have somebody dig it up, move it back. If they had left those fence rows and windbreaks in there, they likely wouldn't have that cost. There's a tool that OMAFRA developed a number of years ago called Ag Maps. You've maybe seen it, it's a mapping tool primarily, but within it are a couple of tools that are embedded in, and one of those is a tool to predict soil erosion. So thinking back to the previous slide, 
on the left, there was two fence rows there, smaller fields, water had a shorter distance to travel, but those fence rows were removed. So using OMAFRA's tool to predict soil erosion, the output on the left still suggests that those smaller fields were at risk of erosion. In fact, it would predict a loss of 37 and a half tons of soil per acre per year, and that's not sustainable. But you take out those two windbreaks, you increase the length of that slope, water has more power as it runs downhill. And now you've increased your soil loss by roughly six tons per acre per year. So again, what's the farmer to do in that case if he starts to recognize soil loss? Well, he might put those wind breaks and fence rows back in. He might have to, again, pay to have grass waterways or berms put in. He might have to pay to have that soil relocated. So, I mean, back to Keith Ralston's quote, by trying to maximize their land area, they're probably doing more harm than good from an environmental perspective and from an economic perspective. So that's kind of some of the, uh, the so what, what happens on the landscape uh, with respect to soil erosion. But again, we come back to the unsung heroes. What else can fence rows and windbreaks provide? And this list isn't exhaustive by any means. There's probably ones you're thinking of now, but they can protect vegetable and crop protection um, or vegetable and crops. They can increase yields. They can disperse odor around barns. They can bring us energy savings around our homesteads. They can act as living snow fences. They can grow carbon. They can be pollinator habitat. They provide biodiversity. They can provide income to the farmer, uh, protection for livestock, wild habitat, and connectivity. And again, that list can go on. We're not going to look at all of these today, uh, just from a time constraint, but we will um, look at a few of them. Dr. Charles Baldwin, Baldwin back in the... Uh, early 80s did some research out of Ridgetown uh, College and he looked at the effect of windbreaks on crop yield and he reports that those crop yields can be increased by up to 15 percent above a farmer's average yield. On the left is a, a graphic that shows the windbreak and in the pinkish purple you'll see that there is a yield reduction within one times the height of the tree. And typically that's because those trees are gonna shade out some of the cropland. But as you start going through two times the height, three times the height, all the way out to 11 times the height of that tree, you're going to expect to see an increase in average yield for that corn crop up to about 15%. Likewise, research showed that for soybeans. Now, a little bit more shading um, to the soybeans. They're not uh, tall like the corn crop, lower to the ground. So you're gonna see some of that yield loss out to about two times the height of the tree. Then again, out to 10 times the height of the tree, we're going to see that yield increase. Now, recent research in the US uh, has suggested that you're not gonna see those yield creases, uh, increases every year. And that's not because of the windbreak per se, but that could be a drought year. It could be a year where there's extra pressure from weeds or disease or insects. But overall, three out of five years, you are going to see that yield increase because you're creating that microclimate downwind of that tr those trees. It's trapping snow. You've got extra moisture in the spring when the plant gets established. It's doing all kinds of good things for that cropland. The other thing that windbreak does, uh, especially in tender fruits and vegetable crops, is it protects those crops from sandblasting. So when that soil gets airborne, and maybe you've uh, done some body work or had some body work done and you sandblast all the loose rust, the loose paint off that vehicle, the blowing sand does the same thing to the vegetable crops. And you can see the picture on the left in the bean crop, those leaves are uh, starting to become uh, desiccated. The corn crop on the right is just leaning with the wind and being scoured, sandblasted by the sand. And what that's gonna lead to is an increase in uh, insect pressures, disease pressure, is certainly gonna result in less yield. Um, corn and the soybeans are fairly tolerant to this. They will rebound to a certain extent, but some of our tender fruit crops like the apple orchards, the pears, the peaches, it can even take out those blossoms. And uh, once those blossoms are gone, the, the fruit yield is gone. 
vegetable crops like your broccolis and others, same thing, much more susceptible to sandblasting than some of our typical field crops. So there is a, a benefit to those windbreaks for our vegetable and crops. A quick look at pollinator habitat. Um, if you think about an open field and the winds uh, coming along at 25, 30 kilometers an hour, it may be too windy on a certain day for some of those pollinators to be active out there. But with a good windbreak, a good fence row on the leeward side, you're gonna have calmer winds and you're likely gonna see more activity from those pollinators on the downwind side. If those outer rows of your windbreaks, or think about some of our fence rows, are planted with flowering trees and shrubs, lilacs, crab apples, choke cherries, nanny berries, uh, hawthorns, you name it, anything with a blossom, is going to provide a food source for beneficial pollinators like honeybees, bumblebees, and butterflies, etc. The other advantage for pollinators is these windbreaks can also reduce pesticide drift, and that creates a safe place for the pollinators. So if you're thinking about creating a windbreak and you're adding some shrubs, you can also add some wildflowers. Not only does it give you some uh, aesthetic benefit, but uh, it can be a benefit for the pollinators, especially if you pick species that stagger their bloom. So example, uh, forsythia is a native shrub that blooms early in the spring. Uh, lilacs tend to be early summer, so you're staggering out that food source for the pollinators. Odor dispersal hasn't been talked about much recently with respect to windbreaks, but there's a couple examples I'll share where windbreaks can mitigate odor. And these odors tend to come from farm operations and they can be the ventilation farms outputting air that's got a smell to it. It can be the manure storage. It could be the feed that's being stored on the farm. But windbreaks can do quite a few things in mitigating that odor. Think about less air movement past the barns or other sources means there's probably less pickup and movement uh, of odor offsite. And, and one of my roles at OMAFRA was to respond to nuisance complaints in Perth County and odor was often uh, probably the number one complaint. But windbreaks can do at least these five things when it comes to reducing odors around barns and manure storages. They're gonna disperse and dilute the odor. They're gonna deposit some of those dust particles, odors particles. Uh, they're going to intercept those particles. Uh, trees will actually absorb some of that odor molecules and uh, the particles. And then of course, aesthetics. Um, sometimes it's out of sight, out of mind. People, when they see a row of trees rather than a barn, their mind tends to uh, go away from the odor and onto how nice the trees look. So a couple of graphics just to show how the windbreaks work. And on the left, we have your typical, it could be poultry, it could be hog barn, uh, lots of ventilation. The odor plume travels along the ground uh, it picks up that smell, it continues to carry it along the ground, and really it's a full strength smell, and that's when the neighbors start to complain. If the farmers were to plant windbreaks upwind and downwind, then there's some benefits that we see. So dispersion, if you think about that air coming to the windbreak up and over, it's gonna take those odors, gases, that smell, it's gonna mix it, it's gonna lift it with cleaner air, and it's gonna dilute that odor downwind. So there's less of an impact. When we establish a quiet zone between the windbreak and the barn or the source of the odor, there's less wind to move that odor off site. And likewise on the downwind side, it slows down the wind with that odor. And actually when it slows it enough, just thinking of uh, a snow fence or a living snow fence, those dust particles, those bigger particles are gonna settle out to the ground and less is going to be carried downwind to become a nuisance odor to the neighbor next door. Notice though, in this case, it is two rows. Uh, windbreaks often we see for crop production, so uh, erosion, one windbreak upwind, but in this case, two is required. And a couple of uh, pictures, examples uh, here, and these windbreaks uh, are located uh, about 75 to 100 feet away from the barns and some good examples of uh, windbreaks that have been planted for the purpose of dispersing odor. 
The one on the left was a case I was involved with back in about 2017, 2018, where a new poultry barn went up. A uh, neighbor across the road was fairly close and happened to be downwind and didn't like the odors coming from the ventilation fans. And so the, the farmer in this case was quite cooperative and uh, had some trees spaded in and uh, put up a double row of Norway spruce that were already fairly well established. And so they uh, served to uh, take that wind, pick it up and over top of the barn, uh, disperse that odor, dilute that odor. odor. And, uh, and that was one of a couple of things that he did that mitigated uh, the odor complaint. Uh, we see this um, as well, anaerobic digesters, where they're storing feedstocks that may be quite odorous and the wind breaks between them and the neighbors uh, can help to lift that odor up and over. But as I said, aesthetics can play a big role in that as well. People don't mind looking at trees and when they can't see the barn, it can take their mind off uh, the odor issue. If we've got trees around our farmstead, uh, our homes, we can see additional benefits from them as well. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on aesthetics. I think everybody here likes trees and uh, the look of trees. And so, as I said, it can be out of sight, out of mind, and it can change people's attitudes towards what they're seeing on the ground. But around the farmstead, those windbreaks can act as living snow fences. And research has shown that they can provide us energy savings. So a living snow fence, this is an example actually of our farm. So the, the laneway coming in on the, the middle right of the photo. And uh, in 2014, we planted a single row of Norway spruce um, to block the prevailing winds coming across the, the field to the west. And I wish I had done this sooner. Uh, for years, I would put up 14 to 16 rolls of snow fence every fall and then take them down again in the spring. And then when we did another planting project, I thought, why aren't we putting a windbreak in there? We didn't pasture that field anymore. We didn't crop it. And since that time, I can attest there's very little snow deposits in that laneway from a west wind. And so the research shows that trees planted along a driveway in the winter uh, will decrease snow removal costs because they trap the snow close to the trees. And you don't have to go out there with a the tractor and blower nearly as many times. Now, research out of Dalhousie University uh, in a document uh, around shelter belts called a growing investment suggests that savings related to snow removal will vary according to the height and porosity of the hedge. So how much air and wind they're allowing through, but a savings of 10 to 20% will be seen after approximately five years if they include at least one row of evergreens. So if you're like me, less time on the tractor in the winter is a good thing, let alone the fuel savings. But municipalities are starting to take note of this as well. And uh, they're starting to have roadside plantings uh, along some of our rural roads. And if you see the guys out in the fall and they're putting up miles and miles and miles of snow fence, they can achieve a lot uh, of the same function at less of a cost over time by putting in wind breaks upwind of a highway. And so the graphic up above again, simply shows that as wind is forced to go around a windbreak or it's slowed going through a windbreak, then the snow starts to settle out and acts like that snow fence. So upwind, downwind, that suspended snow drops to the ground. And by the time it gets to the highway, there's a lot less snow drifting on the road. So that means savings as well for the municipality in terms of road uh, maintenance, salting, sanding, plowing, but it also means a safer commute for those who are using the road. That same study of the, out of Dalhousie looked at energy savings around buildings. And so a little hard to see behind the uh, trees here, but there's a two-story poultry barn. And you can see upwind, they have a fairly well-established row or two of Norway spruce. And it is there to provide energy savings to that barn. And the study of Dalhousie suggests that trees that are planted strategically around farm buildings can save 10 to 15% of heating costs in the winter. A three row mixed windbreak can significantly decrease cooling costs in the summer by up to 70%. And some additional studies out of Nebraska looking at energy savings compared to two houses, uh, both identical houses maintained at 70 degrees Fahrenheit for the winter, one of which had uh, windbreaker shelter built protecting it 
The other did not. And the house protected by the windbreak used 20% less fuel in their winter heating. Uh, likewise, two houses heated by electricity. One was protected, the other was not. This is in South Dakota. And the sheltered home used 34% less, less electricity. So you can see the advantage around our farmsteads um, in increasing or sorry, decreasing the costs of heating and cooling. Moving along, a lot of talk in the last number of years about growing carbon and can there be carbon credits? Can there be carbon offsets from trees? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, when we think of carbon sequestration, we're taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and we're storing it as a solid or we're storing it as a liquid. And so thinking about trees, trees have an outstanding capacity to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. They sequester it for long periods of time, typically in the woody biomass, but also in the soil. A fast rate of growth when the tree is young means that they're sequestering carbon rapidly as well. Research would show they reach a peak at about 30 years. They still will accumulate carbon, but at a slower rate. Um, and they reach a peak in carbon storage, carbon sequestration at about 70 years of age. Now, the Assemble Bayfield Conservation Authority did a study in uh, 2012 through uh, Kazuka Limited. They were looking at from the properties that they held as a conservation authority, how much carbon could there be, would there be, uh, and what would the value be of those credits if there was a, a process in place to sell them. And so these are some of the species that they took a look at. I would say it's fairly representative. I think, you know, some of the issues I see with the uh, the table, uh, not too many aspen, uh, white birch, red pine, white pine are gonna make it to hundred years. So maybe 70 years would have been that better if that's where they peak anyway. But you can see that there's more uh, storage in some species stored per hectare per year than others. So example, aspen stores just over a, a ton of carbon per hectare per year in that first uh, kind of 10 years of growth. Red pine significantly more, white spruce again significantly less at um, at 0.62, and so the range uh, again may influence us on what type of trees we want depending on the purpose, but certainly 70% uh, of sequestered carbon is in that vegetative tissue. Some of it's in the soil. The advantage to storing that carbon in trees is that when it's harvested and put into furniture, put into pallets, you're extending the lifespan, the life cycle of that carbon. So it's not just when you have the windbreak there, but if there's an opportunity to harvest some trees out of there in the future and reuse them, then you're still storing carbon. So you've been won over. Uh, trees, uh, windbreaks, shelter belts, fence rows, do a lot, they're the unsung heroes and you've decided now it's time to plant one on your property. And, and so what are the, some of the things that we need to consider if we're planning for a windbreaker shelter boat? The first would be density and that refers to how much space is between the, the trees. And that determines how much wind uh, is gonna be reduced and how much area that the windbreak can shelter. And density is most heavily affected by tree species. So. Picture a 10-year-old Norway spruce, uh, picture a 10-year-old sugar maple, and it's pretty obvious to see how much wind can be slowed down by the conifer versus the deciduous. So we can categorize density as low, and so low density will be good uh, to disperse snow evenly throughout an area, uh, retain some moisture in the spring, and it can help with that wind and water erosion. It's a medium density that gives us the largest area of protection in the land and reduces wind speed over the greatest distance compared to higher or lower density. So it's good for reducing erosion and sheltering buildings. If we truly go high density, really what we're doing is we're planting a wall. And we would do that if we're trying to protect livestock from winds in the winter, if we're trying to prevent snow from building up but it can cause additional turbulence around the ends of those windbreaks. 
And so we need to be cautious about how thick that windbreak is. And we'll talk about it uh, shortly, but that's why with some of these high density windbreaks, we need to do some thinning and maintenance. And so really it comes down to uh, the purpose as well. So if we're protecting crops and soil, we probably want to plant uh, at about 20 to 50% density. If we're thinking about uh, protecting against blowing and drifting snow, we're, we're thinking about 50 to 65% um, density. And if we get uh, up above 65%, um, then we're looking at things like energy savings and we're looking at livestock protection. We need to think about height of our windbreak as well. So this also uh, alludes to how big of an area that we want to protect. So if you remember the, the research by Dr. Baldwin showing that the benefits can go 10, 11 times the height of the trees, then perhaps eventually taller trees are what we would desire. So are we planting shrubs? Are we planting cedar? Are we planting spruce? Are we planting uh, a hybrid poplar? What is it we want to achieve for area? And so a medium density windbreak that has at least a 10 meter height can take those 50 kilometer hour winds and knock them down by at least 10 kilometers for 200 meters across that field. And that reduction is enough to reduce erosion and achieve that yield increase. And so remembering that the area of greater protection is found at a distance of eight to 10 times the height of the windbreak. So besides density and height, we need to think about length. And we really should be extending that windbreak a little bit further than the area that we want to protect uh, because winds will come around the ends of those windbreaks and can cause some issues if it's unprotected. Width uh, really comes down to your preference and, and how much land you have available for that windbreak or shelter belt. So the more rows in a windbreak, the denser that windbreak will be over time. Uh, most applications of windbreaks, one row will provide sufficient width. And uh, an example I'll show later, um, a double row windbreak over uh, the width of a farm is using up about one acre of land, depending on your spacing. Uh, so the wider you go, the more land you're also going to be using. Spacing, uh, as trees mature, each row should be thin to provide adequate space for proper growth. So, so give them thought to how close those trees are going to be to one another, how close those rows are going to be to one another. And there's a trade-off here. So you plant the trees fairly far apart, the rows fairly far apart. There may not be a whole lot of future maintenance and thinning, but the, the effect, the function of that windbreak is going to take a little longer time to become established. So if you plant more trees than what you really need in the windbreak, um, you can take some out as you need be. But in my uh, experience, you're going to lose a few trees to mortality in that windbreak as well. Some of the rule of thumb uh, that comes from University of Nebraska Lincoln, and I think it differs from uh, what we see here in Ontario, is the uh, the windward rows uh, of dense conifers. So it could be your cedar, it could be your gnarly spruce. They're suggesting six to twelve feet between trees and twelve to twenty feet between the rows. Uh, and you can see the other. Uh, suggestions here. So planting shrubs a little bit closer uh, between shrubs and between the rows. The, their explanation for the greater spacing between tree rows, they want to leave at least an extra four feet for equipment to get down there and do maintenance. But in my uh, experience here, uh, the closer the trees and the rows are together, the quicker that they're going to suppress the weeds, suppress the grasses, uh, the function's gonna be there a little bit earlier. And yes, we may have to thin some out in the future, but uh, I would think a little bit closer spacing um, like we do here in Ontario, whether that's seven feet between trees, eight feet between rows is probably a bit more realistic. So species selection really comes down to what is the goal for the windbreak, soil type, drainage and personal preference. And I'm just going to go through a few slides here that can help uh, you with some resources. So a field windbreak best measurement practice book from OMAFRA is available on their website. 
and it lists uh, a lot of the common species and then takes a look at hardiness zones, soil picture class, soil drainage and desired density, pH uh, amongst others. And so if you take a look at that, where there's an X, those trees will do well. So in the top row, red maple doesn't mine sand, loam, clay, loam or clay, and uh, will provide medium density. On the other hand, uh, you get down to hybrid poplars. They don't really like sand and they don't like it wet. So common sense, some trees like wet feet, some trees like dry feet. And so you can take a look at that resource as well. Uh, OMAFRA has a couple of the tools. So I showed you the erosion tool. This one is if you want to take a look at establishing windbreak or block planting, you can go on to egg maps. You can draw the line where your windbreak is going to be, answer a few questions about what kind of trees, why you're planting them. Um, and it's going to produce an output that looks like this. And it's tough to see, I know, as the output, but basically it's going to give you a map of your area. And if you remember this example where the farmer took out his windrows, I use that as an example to say, okay, we're going to put a double row windbreak back in. I told them it was tile drained. I wanted Norway spruce and I wanted Eastern white cedar. And I zoomed in a little bit on the output. So my two rows is going to take up about an acre of land. It tells me that I'm, my, what my hardiness zone is, my soil texture, drainage class. It tells me what conservation authority I'm in. This might be important if I want to talk to them about funding. And then circled in red down below, it summarizes if I wanted eastern white cedar over the length of that row, I'm going to need 983 trees. This hardiness zone is suitable. It's not a pollinator species. It's texture suitable. Cost about 165 per tree means I'm going to spend $1,600 roughly on those trees, not counting planting. And a note, because I said my field was tile drained, it's going to say, well, guess what? Eastern white cedars prone to clogging field tiles. So maybe it will change my mind. Another best management practice book establishing tree cover uh, can lead you uh, into perhaps planting cover crops, dwarf white clover, uh, annual ryegrass, just to help with weed suppression and uh, helps get those trees through the first few years of growth with minimal um, competition. Or using plastic mulch uh, can be used at planting and it retains water and helps to reduce weed growth. I'm gonna skip through a few of these fairly quickly simply because we're getting short on time. But if we planted it or windbreak or shelter belt, we need to maintain it. And so in the first number of years, we need to do some weed control and that can be manual. That can be with herbicide like glyphosate. We probably need to restock if there's been some tree mortality. And as that tree gets bigger and the density gets uh, too dense, we're probably gonna need to do some pruning and thinning to maintain that porosity and prevent damage to farm equipment. And again, if you go to the OMAFRA's website and you Google on YouTube, there are four windbreak videos there that can help with planting and uh, maintenance of those windbreaks. And so picture on the left was that first one I showed you, that three uh, row of white pine, uh, white cedar, Norway spruce. It's mature. It's probably acting more as a wall. There's not enough porosity there. So it's probably an example of one that should be thin. Picture on the right is uh, Forrester John Enright from the Upper Thames River CA out with a client and they're looking at a recent thinning job on farms. So to maintain that porosity of 25 to 50%, you're gonna need to do some thinning eventually. And the risk of not doing that, especially for vegetable and field crops, is that dead zone without much air movement is going to increase your uh, disease and insect pressures. So who will help pay? I don't have a list for you and I'm suggesting you're gonna need to do some local research. So of course there's a 50 million tree program out there. Some municipalities have municipal stewardship programs that uh, things like rural water quality programs that have tree planting as part of that. Best to check with your local conservation authority and to see what they are aware of in terms of those programs. Some provincial programs administered through Ontario Soil and Crop, you do require an environmental farm plan, but Species at Risk Farm and Center Program and Resilient Agricultural Landscape Program may offer you funding uh, for tree planting and windbreaks. And so with that, I'm gonna end it there and uh, Olivia open it up for questions if there are some. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dave.
Um, really appreciate it and uh, you taking the time to speak with everyone today and sharing all this information with us. You certainly have made a clear case for, for wind breaks and fence rows and uh, looked at it from several perspectives and angles. Um, now, I just wanted to check in with you, Dave, before we dive into questions. Are you able to stay on for a couple of minutes to answer a few? I can, sure. Okay, great, great. Um, so for the folks that uh, might be joining us for a lunch break and have to get back to things soon, this report, this uh, presentation is being recorded. Um, so you can always tune in later. Um, now I'll just invite people to submit questions that they have to the chat, or sorry, to the Q&A. Um, and before we get into those, I just wanted to share a little something that we have for you, Dave. Um, it is a book called Around the World in 80 Trees. We hope that you that you enjoy it. Very good. Thank you very much. Great. Um, so I'll just get back to the screen here and I'll just put up our sponsors again as we get into Q&A. So there's quite a few coming in here. Um, so I did see one that popped up fairly early on. Um, and I noticed that you did have a slide about this, but they were asking whether you, um, whether there are native species that could be used instead of Norway spruce. Certainly. Um, I mean, Eastern white cedar, white pine, white spruce are all good conifers that, uh, that can be used. Uh, Norway spruce just happens to be a preference of mine. Uh, it's a little faster growing. It gets established a bit, but recognizing that it's not considered a, a native species. Great. Thank you, Dave. And like I mentioned as well, this is being recorded, so people are welcome to uh, take a look at that slide again. Um, so we have a, a another question here. Someone said, I have a white spruce windbreak on the west side of our farm. With the windstorms of the past years in eastern Ontario, we have experienced a domino effect of the wind taking out the rows by the roots. What trees or planting configurations would help offset this problem in the future? That's a good question. I think there's probably a lot of different um, things we can look at. One, um, I would suggest first, is the windbreak too dense? So is the wind hitting it as a wall? And that's what's uh, doing the uprooting. So could there be some thinning to open up the porosity, let a little bit of uh, that wind through it, um, knowing it may not withstand the extremes, but some of those bigger windstorms, it may not have the effect. And then white spruce uh, is fairly shallow rooted. Uh, so maybe looking at other species that uh, are a little bit more uh, deeper rooted, even putting uh, species like that upwind as protection for, you know, some of the more shallower rooted species downwind. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've got a few more questions rolling in here. Um, so this next one isn't as much related to farming, but still relevant. Um, in the golf business, to protect green from tree root intrusion, one runs a ditch um, every few years to dig and then fill back and then backfill a narrow trench two or three feet deep and cut the tree roots near the green. Would that work to stop roots from reaching tiled fields? It might. I've never uh, thought about it that way, but I guess in sense what you're doing is you're doing some root pruning. And if you're going to stop the outward growth of that uh, possible, uh, you'd have to take into consideration just how much of that root can be pruned, how close to the stem, uh, because you wouldn't want to um, cause any damage to those trees as well. But uh, some of it may be just if you're establishing a, uh, the windbreak, you know, don't plant seed or look at some other species. If you're putting tile in, uh, make sure you stay well enough away that the roots aren't going to, uh, to get there. But if a ditch witch will work, uh, it'd be interesting to give that a try somewhere and see what the results were. Thank you. Um, so there's another one here, um, establishment mortality um, and resultant gaps in windbreaks. What is your preferred method to fix this? Or would you simply allow for longer term? Uh, would you simply allow in the longer term for the, the windbreak to fill in with survivors? I think that's a, a question that really each owner needs to make on their own. My preference, I've always gone back and filled in those gaps uh, with newer trees uh, for at least the first five years. Once they get to five years, I don't bother because they will start to fill in. But I'll use the example of our living snow fence along the laneway. And uh, if I had three or four trees that didn't make it, I'd go back and plant those simply because with that gap, I was, I was getting snow across the laneway. So 
really comes down to what's the purpose and how long are you willing to wait for those trees to fill in naturally and function as, as you want them to function. Great. Um, so I think we'll take perhaps one more question, the Q&A, and then maybe see if any of the folks that have raised their hands still have a question that they would like to, um, to be unmuted to ask. Um, so the question in the Q&A, is there a way to show farmers that sequestration of carbon in windbreaks go hand in hand with conservation tillage practice and carbon sequestration by using them? <laughs> Excellent question. And uh, not that I'm biased, but when I worked for Amafra, we worked on a tool um, that is again is part of what's called AgriSuite. And you could take a whole farm approach. Farmers can use this to look at their tillage practices, emissions from livestock, benefits of windbreaks and forests, and come out with a value for their farm on where and how much uh, emissions there were. One of the examples uh, we use all the time uh, in this, and this was done with a software called uh, Holos that the federal government put together, is a uh, co-worker out of the Peterborough area, runs a cow-calf beef farm, grows sweet corn. And so we all know that cows emit methane, farm equipment emits carbon dioxide, and so on. And he took into account all of those using the software. When he included his 10-acre woodlot, it negated all of his emissions. So he was really what he would consider to be net zero. And so the benefit of leaving trees on farms, not taking them out, I think if we ever get to the point where um, farmers are recognized for all the carbon sequestration tools that they have, whether it be um, windbreaks, forests, uh, tillage, uh, manure management, nutrient management, whatever it might be, uh, those tools are gonna become important. And I think they can demonstrate that they're all part of a whole system approach and certainly trees are a big piece of that. I think we will leave it at that for the, uh, the Q&A session for tonight. Um, so thank you very much, Dave. Um, I see that Dorothy has her camera on. I'm not sure if she wanted to add one more thing, but just before she may do that, I'll just say that um, next week's presentation will be about Hemlock Holy Adelgid with Ken Elliott, RPF on Wednesday, February 21st from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, so I will put that in the chat as well. No, I just like to, no, I just ahead, like to thank Dave for an excellent presentation. That's exactly what I was looking for, and I'm hoping that we that we get some positive response. Uh, uh, one program that he didn't mention was Alice. Uh, maybe um, it's it is scattered throughout Ontario, but it's it's very active here in in our area, but uh, they do provide uh, farmers with uh, opportunities for doing things like putting in shelter belts and uh, windrows, and along with wetlands and, and other things. So uh, so I'd like to put, put a salute out to Alice for that as well. Thanks, Dorothy. Uh, I know um, Alice has several locations across the province, um, including Niagara, Peterborough, and certainly the Southwest, and I'm sure I'm missing a few others as well. Um, so thank you again, Dave, for joining us. Um, thank you to the planning committee for organizing the Kenville Winter Woodlot Conference series. Um, and with that, we'll uh, we'll close things up for today. Thank you again. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care.